what's up guys? I'm Danielle. I work as an acute care nurse practitioner and today we're going to talk about STEMI. This is just going to be a brief overview of how to recognize, manage, and treat STEMI. Our objectives for this is going to be a little bit of the pathophysiology, the difference between a STEMI and a non-STEMI, risk factors, symptoms, and how we treat STEMIs. Okay, so a STEMI and a non-STEMI are both heart attacks. And what happens is, in the left here, you can see a normal lumen. Blood can flow through that and everything is well on the earth, right? But because of our diets and everything that we eat and age and all the risk factors that we'll talk about soon, plaque starts to build up in our arteries. And when this plaque builds up, it can build up so much that it can cause an inclusion to the artery, or sometimes this plaque can rupture off and the endothelial cells can come and essentially the body will create this clotting cascade. And when that happens is all these clotting factors come together to try to heal this and it'll occlude the, it'll occlude the lumen here. Another thing that can happen is sometimes the plaque can rupture and flow down the cardiac artery to a smaller part and occlude that, and that can cause a STEMI or a non-STEMI. So it's an acute occlusion, essentially, and both of them can lead to heart attack. But essentially, it's a prolonged imbalance between oxygen supply and demand. So the heart is saying, hey, I need more oxygen, but for whatever reason, because of an occlusion or thrombus, the heart is not able to get this oxygen. And when that happens, that causes cardiac cell death. Now, approximately 1.2 million people have heart attacks a year. And every minute, someone is dying of a heart attack. What is the difference between a STEMI and a non-STEMI? Well, first we need to actually know what a STEMI is. A STEMI is an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. And I'll show you what this looks like. And a non-STEMI is a non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. So in a STEMI, you're gonna have ST segment elevation. In a non-STEMI, you're not. So non-STEMI is no ST segment elevation. Both of them are heart attacks. So that is something to be clear about. So STEMI, ST segment elevation. Non-STEMI, no ST segment elevation. Now there are some difference in treatments. A STEMI generally implies a larger occlusion and a non-STEMI is less myocardial damage. It's, um, it's not as emergent. So with the STEMI, you're automatically gonna go to the cath lab or get fibrolytics, all right? So you're gonna get clot busters or you're gonna go to the cath, and we'll talk about that later in just a second. Whereas a non-STEMI, these are typically incomplete occlusions and smaller branches or smaller arteries are occluded. So these patients can wait sometimes depending on the severity of their symptoms and what they come in with. Um, and like I said before, in a STEMI, it's typically implied that there's more myocardial damage. In an NSTEMI, there's typically less myocardial damage, but not always. But the major difference is one has ST elevation and requires emergent treatment, and the other one has non-ST elevation. And depending on the symptoms, most of the time, these patients can wait, but not always, and this will vary patient to patient. So a ST segment elevation, if you guys look here, there's V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6 on the left, um, on the right hand side here. So if you look in V1, you can see the ST um, segment is elevated, right? That's, that's clear out of the park here, ST segment elevation. Uh, is definitely elevated in contiguous leads. So when I say contiguous leads, to diagnose a STEMI, what you need is ST segment elevations in contiguous leads. And contiguous leads means um, areas that are similar in infarct. So V1 and V2 are essentially in this, a similar region of the heart. So contiguous leads means just a similar region of the heart. You can't have it in V1 only and that's it and say, hey, this, uh, um, this is a STEMI, it's usually in contiguous infarcts, um, so similar areas of the heart. A non-STEMI is ischemia, 
so as well, but there's not any ST segment elevation. What you'll see is a ST segment depression at times. And other times you'll see T wave inversions. And you can see this on a STEMI as well, but the key with the key factor that differentiates a STEMI versus a non STEMI is ST segment elevation. What are the risk factors for heart attacks? Well, increasing age. So you can see 66 is around the average for a heart attack. Males are generally the tie here. Males are generally at higher risk. Ob uh, obesity, and it depends on where you're fat. Central obesity in the stomach is a very high risk factor. Diabetes, high cholesterol, um, smoking, poor diet, poor intake of vegetables and fruits, lack of exercise, the sedentary lifestyle, um, high cholesterol, like I said before, um, all can contribute to heart attacks. So it, it's important for nurses, and I think society in general, we always treat the symptoms, but it's like putting a band-aid on the problem. If we can teach these patients, hey, preventative measures beforehand, then we can stop so many heart attacks from coming because most of the things, most of the patients that come in with heart attack, it's issues that can be resolved. What are the symptoms of a heart attack? Well, this is commonly known as the Levine sign. It's common, chest pain. So when they come in and they're ha they have a clenched fist over their mid sternal chest area, that is the Levine sign. So chest pain is the typical sign that you'll see. Other things that you'll have are back patients may complain of back pain as well. Um, radiating to the back, radiating to the neck, the jaw, the arms. They also may have epigastric pain, um, but those are some of the common symptoms that you'll see, or it'll go down the arm as well. So this is how do you diagnose a STEMI, a ST segment elevation? Well, you're going to get a 12 lead EKG. That's the first and foremost thing you're going to do because these patients are going to need emergent treatment. So if the 12 lead shows uh, ST elevations, as you guys can see here, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, all have ST segment elevation. Look at how much that is. Um, then this is definitely a, a patient that is developing a, is having a heart attack. So 12 lead EKG. Now cardiac markers are also important to get, but in a STEMI, which is different, you're not going to wait until these cardiac markers come back because your patient could be dead before then. Um, you're going to need uh, emergent treatment. So the number one thing that we need to get in these patients are a 12 lead and cardiac enzymes. Yes, but that's not. We're not going to allow that to delay our treatment in a patient with ST segment elevations. Now, I see patients with STEMIs all the time that come in, and it's just very important to recognize these patients as we were talking about signs and symptoms. Um, do you smoke? When's the last time you've seen the doctor? Do you exercise? Have you had chest pain before? It's also important to just educate the patients. A lot of patients will come in. I have a patient essentially every other week that I take care of in the ER and they'll come in and I'll say, hey, have you had chest pain before? Yeah, I had chest pain, well, when? Well, when I was moving furniture or uh, when I was at work, but I waited and it went away. So it's important to educate these people, hey, if you're having chest pain, you need to come into the ER because um, this could be an evolving myocardial infarction and it can definitely lead to death. Um, in these patients. Um, a lot of them will go into ventricular arrhythmias and try to die essentially right in front of you. And some patients we not may not even uh, get back. I had a patient, he was 40 something and he had had a heart attack and he had stopped taking his blood thinners and he was helping a friend move his some furniture and then he essentially just kind of dropped at the scene and um, they did CPR at the scene but we were unable to fully ever get him back, but he had this evolving myocardial infarction. So uh, it's just important. How do we treat STEMIs? 
Well, aspirin and router, as soon as they get to the emergency room, is essentially because that'll essentially decrease clot formation, improve mortality, and decrease the infarct size. So aspirin. Nitroglycerin is another one. We just And this will help essentially vasodilate those cardiac arteries to get more blood supply to the heart. But we want to make sure that um, their blood pressure is able to tolerate nitroglycerin because if their blood pressure is so low, then we can potentially... Um, decrease their blood pressure even lower and that'll be even worse for a cardiac and a myocardial infarction. So nitroglycerin, another reason, another, you want to be cautious in giving, you don't want to give myocardial nitroglycerin to patients with a uh, right ventricular infarct and this can be uh, seen on the EKG and um, the doctor, whoever you're with, can to help determine whether or not these, these patients are having a right uh, RV, po a possible RV infarct because patients with a right ventricular infarct are preload dependent, so they don't need the nitroglycerin. And patients who have low blood pressure also don't need the light nitroglycerin because they can't tolerate it. Morphine is good. This also has an anxiolytic effect, so this can help the patients relax and in turn help get more oxygen to the tissues that way and decrease pain, so morphine is good. Oxygen is new in the sense that we've always been taught for years that as soon as they come in, patients put them on oxygen, put them on oxygen, put them on oxygen, they need oxygen. Well, now the 2006 ACLS guidelines are saying, hey, if their oxygen is normal, don't put them on oxygen because if you do and their oxygen is normal, then you can actually increase the size of the infarct. So you don't want to do that. I had a patient the other day that was having a huge myocardial infarct, but his oxygen saturations were 100%. So uh, the respiratory therapist, she came in and she slapped oxygen on them. We had to take that away because the new guidelines are saying, hey, this can actually potentially increase the size of infarction. So we don't want to do that if their oxygen is normal. If there's not, if their oxygen is low, put it on them. But if not, then leave it off of them. You don't want to increase that infarct size. Beta blockers are good. They have been shown to decrease demand on the heart, which is good when you're having a heart attack. And it's been shown to decrease mortality. ACE inhibitors, during a, after a heart attack, your heart tends to remodel, meaning that it can get stiffer, it can change size and shape. Well, ACE inhibitors help prevent this more, uh, remodeling and they've also been shown to decrease mortality. So ACE inhibitors are very important. Statins, absolutely. Um, you want to get on board. And the most important thing for patients with STEMIs are PCI and thrombolytics. Now, this is where it gets different, um, particularly from a non-STEMI. Um, a non-STEMI person, depending, may not need a PCI, a percutaneous coronary intervention, um, right away. And they're not going to need thrombolytics right away. That's just not the treatment for a non-STEMI. But a ST segment elevation um, which essentially preludes to a bigger size of an infarct, is going to need emergent coronary art intervention or thrombolytics. Now, what is the difference between coronary intervention and thrombolytics? Well, coronary intervention is the preferred way. What happens here is they'll go in through the artery in your femoral or radial, femoral artery or radial artery, and what they'll do is they'll take a catheter, and this catheter will have a balloon attached to it. It'll go up to the heart, to the um, area of occlusion, and it'll be they'll be using um, x-rays and stuff to see, essentially, you'll actually see this. Um, so the cardiac uh, cardiologist will be able to see exactly where it is. They'll shoot dye, and it'll show an occlusion. Now, if they can, they'll take that catheter with a balloon and kind of balloon open that artery, open all that blockage up, and hopefully um, place a stent there if they're able to do so. Now, thrombo, and that's the preferred treatment because um, it works a lot better than thrombolytics, and the incidence of reocclusion is lower compared to thrombolytics. Now, thrombolytics are... We still have these because thrombolytics are essentially, if you can't get 
if you can't get to a PCI in time. So the the preferred time is is what our goal time for a coronary intervention with a balloon angioplasty is door to balloon within 90 minutes. Now thrombolytics are within 30 minutes you want to be given that, but thrombolytics please hold off on them if you can because one they have a high re they have a higher reocclusion rate. Two, they may not bust open the clot. Um, they're, and then, and then these patients can have a brain bleed. I had a elderly lady come in and she was having a heart attack, and she received thrombolytics and she actually got a head bleed. So these can cause um, significant bleedings. The the places that um, are don't have access to coronary interventions. Um, Yes, use thrombolytics, but if you have a PCI and you can get that in time, that is the preferred way to go. Now, how do I remember and how should you remember all of these drugs and um, treatments for these patients? Well, Mona is one, and I'm sure you've been taught this in nursing school. That's what I was taught. Morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin. Absolutely. So I do morph Mona past... PAST beta blockers, BB. So Mona pass beta blocker. So the percutaneous coronary intervention, ACE inhibitors, statins, thrombolytics, beta blockers, blood thinners. You want blood thinners on too just to prevent the reocclusion. So we talked about what a little bit of the pathophysiology of a heart attack. We talked about the difference between a non-STEMI and a STEMI. We've discussed risk factors. We've also discussed um, treatment. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give me a like. Let me know on topics that you would like me to talk about, ways that I can improve, and subscribe below. See you later.